Molt bé, bona tarda a tothom. Thanks, Otto, for accepting our invitation. I'll make a short presentation in Catalan, and then I'll switch over to you. I'll make a brief presentation. És un gran plaer, és un gran plaer tenir nosaltres el doctor Otto Zibum, que actualment és el Hans Rausing professor de Història de la Ciència a la Universitat d'Uppsala i el director de l'Office for History of Science a la mateixa universitat, que és part del Departament d'Història de les Idees. Amb l'Otto Zibum, no, el doctor Zibum, però amb l'Otto, amb l'Otto Zibum ens van conèixer fa anys a Cambridge. Ell havia arribat procedent d'Oldenburg, on va estudiar física i es va començar a interessar per la història de la física i molt especialment pels experiments científics i per la manera d'obtenir informació sobre experiments clàssics com el que ens explicarà avui a través de la rèplica, la reconstrucció dels experiments. El seu treball és, m'atreveixo a dir, summament interessant. Jo crec que dels enfocs historiogràfics de les últimes dècades és un dels més novedosos perquè, malgrat que connecta molt bé amb altres enfocaments dins la història història de la ciència i la sociologia del coneixement científic, l'Otos diu que li ha donat un tom particular, un gest especial. Un dels conceptes que ell ha elaborat és el de coneixement gestual, o en anglès gestual knowledge, i crec que avui ens parlarà una mica d'aquest concepte. I la idea és que podem recuperar a través de la recreació, del performance d'un experiment antic, part d'aquest coneixement tàcit que no arriba als textos, però que tanmateix és essencial per entendre què és el que va passar i com va arribar un experimentador o un elaborador de cervesa, en el cas de James Joule, els resultats tan extraordinaris. Recuperant aquest context, aquests resultats potser resulten menys extraordinaris o genials dels que sembla. És obligat que digui, també només per situar-nos, que l'Otto, després de l'estada a Cambridge, va anar a l'Institut Max Planck d'Història de la Ciència a Berlín, on durant gairebé 12 anys, 12 anys a Berlín, va dirigir un grup a l'Institut Max Planck i després, el 2007, va obtenir la càtedra, la CHER, a Uppsala, que actualment ocupa. En tots aquests anys, a banda del treball que ens explicarà avui i molts articles, ha coeditat diversos llibres, i només esmento alguns perquè els tingueu presents. The Heavens on Earth, Observatories and Astronomy in 19th Century Science and Culture, que ha coeditat amb dos autors més, i també ha coeditat un volum dedicat als instruments, Instruments, Travel and Science. Crec que és... li puc donar la paraula, agraint-li una vegada més que estigui aquí. So, thanks, Otto, it's over to you, and I'll sit the audience there. Thank you very much. Xavier, I didn't know that I so understand so much Catalan, I noticed. I mean, I got some <laughs> from what you said. So thank you very for the kind introduction. And um, yeah, today uh, I'd like to talk about an experiment which I have done many years ago, and um, particularly to use this as an opportunity to understand better how can one historically understand the role of tacit knowledge in science. But this also requires a um, different approach than historians usually do, not reading texts only, but in particular to um, ask the silent representative of the parts, so the instruments, what they have to tell about the history. So imagine you have the time and resources to build a complete replica of an early 19th century scientific experiment and to reenact the trial in a similar architectural space. The outcome of such an endeavor is first of all a glorious mess, but one with extraordinarily powerful effects. But before I'm going into detail about this experience, just a few remarks about the experiment in question. Uh, today we find various iconic representations like this one in physics textbooks conveying the claim that it was constitutive in the formation of a great physical principle, the conservation of energy. Moreover, science museums display tabletop versions produced during the centuries to illustrate this great achievement in science too. 
However, such representations, as well as the scientist's own description of the experimental procedure, create an image of the experimental sciences which have not much to do with the lived practice of science. As soon as we put our hands onto the apparatus, a world of physics reveals itself rather different from the polished world on paper with its apparently clear rules and procedures. For example, if you perform in such a space as Jewel did, you will learn that uniformity of temperature described in his publication still has to be understood as continuous fluctuations in temperature from 1 to 1 and a 5 degrees Fahrenheit. How could Joule have been accurate in his readings at all? Moreover, the immediate response of the sensitive thermometer to body radiation and the demand to maintain a uniform room temperature require one to firstly shield the experimenter's body from the thermometer and secondly to exclude witness from entering the laboratory during the trials. But even then we wonder how is it possible to perform accurate heat measurements under such conditions? How is it possible at all to read off a thermometer scale that has markings on it with distances between 0 0.8 millimeter, let alone doing so in poor light? Instead of providing a full list of troubles involved in performing the experiment, let me briefly list the most important issues. The choreography of actions derived from the publication did not harmonize with the course of action experienced with the replica. An assistant, unnamed in the text, was necessary to manage the mechanical operation of the experiment. A replica constructed according to the scale drawings in Jules' publications did not allow a repetition of the experiment that corresponds with the results he recorded there. Only further studies with the surviving historical instrument in the Science Museum in London yielded the information that was required to achieve this. Although James Jewell himself prepared careful draft illustrations of, this, uh, of his instrument and apparatus, these were not exact enough to carry out a successful replication. The laboratory notebook itself yielded no traces of those techniques of temperature measurement that I came to recognize as most important in carrying out the experiment. It was also shown similarly that Joule could not have acquired this knowledge in the science of his time, since the techniques of measurement required were not cared for there. So with regard to the troubles experienced, it seems reasonable to ask whether Joule could have done the experiment at all. Or does the failure of a successful performance simply demonstrate my incompetence as a physicist and have I just given proof that Joule was a genius? Furthermore, do these experiences point at tacit dimensions of Joule's laboratory life that possibly had escaped the historian's eye? The biographer Donald Cardwell was equally concerned with Joule's impressive skills. So in 1984, he, for example, uh, summarized it as follows, and I quote here Cartwell. Another conspicuous feature of his scientific personality was the immense skill and precision that marked his experiments from the very beginning. How did he acquire these gifts, characteristic of the thorough professional? Unfortunately, we know little about his tutors. They are shadowy figures. And Dalton was never renowned for experimental accuracy. In the final analysis, hence, I must concede that these particular gifts were bestowed by providence and not by his fellow man, quotation end. Donald Cartwell was creating here an image of the great scientist who made extraordinary achievements, but Jules' genius mysteriously lacked historical explanation. When communicating with Cartwell in the 1990s, he agreed that it would be most urgent to tackle again the question how skills would be achieved and where one could learn them. And this is what I will do tonight. I will draw your attention to the relationship between practical knowledge and science and the role of the human body in the scientific knowledge production. I would like to suggest that it is possible to reveal the often hidden connections between individual scientists' embodied knowledge and collectives, traditions, and realms of experience. 
but one has to acknowledge that these links are not always readily accessible through written resources alone. Furthermore, exploring these experiential spaces requires a performative historiography. And let me explain what I mean by this. Over the last decade, historians of science have become greatly interested in the silent representatives of the past, so instruments, or more generally speaking, the material culture, and the knowing body of the scientist. However, most studies indicate existence of hidden dimensions of scientific practice by means of identifying previously neglected hands, so skilled laboratory assistants, for example the disciplining of the scientist centers in the educational settings, or they admitted an important but ephemeral tacit or personal knowledge involved in scientific change. Generally speaking, historians know quite a lot about the scientific construction, the representation, and the disciplining of the body, but still too little about the productive role of the human body, which means the cognitive implications of their bodily disciplining. Reasons for this unsatisfactorily situation are manifold, and I will just mention the two most relevant ones. Firstly, historians and historians of science traditionally have developed their tools of the trade exclusively through engagement in the practices of a literary culture. Despite their increasing interest in the hardware of science or the body techniques of their users, they often lack appropriate diagnostic tools and procedures. Instead, some even declare the history of tacit knowledge as nearly, and I quote here Mario Birgioli, as nearly impossible archaeological feat because it is usually impossible to go back and find or operate the original instruments in their original settings and setups. Quotation end. Secondly, academic research is still to a large degree part of an influential tradition that defines knowledge as being rational, cerebral, ubiquitous and communicable through texts. Consequently, the implied divide between epistemology and practice led to a denigration of forms of knowing which are apparently embodied and local. The approach of reworking past experimental practice has been developed with just the aim to make the impossible archaeological feat possible and to challenge the mentioned epistemological divide. But it is important to mention that this diagnostic adventure is not just drawing the reader's attention away from the software to the hardware of science. No, it uses performance of historical experiments as a complementary technique within conventional historical scholarship in order to provide access to these silent representatives of the past and to study the self-evident gestures at work in the, in the laboratories. Historians of gesture have pointed to the same methodological problem, that they, and I quote them, cannot walk through the streets of the past in order to observe ordinary situations. Usually they work with incomplete documentation, which is more often biased towards the exceptional than to the normal events of everyday life. Quotation end. Therefore, they watch out for sites of social friction where norms get questioned and self-evident human behaviors become objects of attention and debate. Complementary to this approach, reworking historical experiments, including the performance of experimental trials, is not dependent on documents of the exceptional. In the contrary, it allows the investigation of the mundane, the self-evident gestures at work in the laboratories of the past. We can study key aspects of the knowing body of the scientist and the changing self-evidence of gestures even of those experiments performed without any audience. By the way, a rising form of experimental work to be observed at least since the early 19th century. By means of performing historical experiment with replicas of scientific apparatus and studying their technical breakdowns, the failures, we reveal dimensions of past practice hitherto unrecognized even by the actors themselves or their contemporaries. Doing an experiment and recognizing the troubles encountered in getting it to work creates an awareness of the behavior of the historical experimenter and the techniques, probably unarticulated, 
which were indispensable for the performance of the experiment. Not even in Joule's notebook we find hints about the techniques of temperature measurement because they were self-evident for Joule. Moreover, reworking past experiments depends above all on the improvisational work and knowledge of the researchers and the material objects, as well as the accompanying texts, serve as a kind of choreography for this performance, because they provide partial direction of our thinking and acting. This locally created working knowledge I have termed gestural knowledge. The unfamiliar concept will break from the traditional static concept of disembodiment of knowledge in favor of a conception of knowledge united with the actor's performance of work, which changes according to the specific kinds of performance, for example in the manipulation of an instrument or the use of mathematical tools, and in ever new historical circumstances. So therefore, repeating past experiments should not be regarded as showing that they function reliably. Reworking aims at exploring the forms of knowing involved in these performances. While in traditional studies, knowledge achieved through the use of instruments are simply understood as skills, competences or practices, with this conception of gesture knowledge, we succeed in overcoming the fundamental systematic separation of epistemology and practice, which itself has a long historical development. Skills or manual capabilities are now to be considered a constitutive part of the knowledge of the experimenter. What the physical chemist Michael Pulani once designated as tacit or personal knowledge can now be described as the expression of a historically located gestural knowledge, which is historically embodied in the form of the performative actions of the experimenters or in part in the artifacts. And most importantly, their cultural origins can be retrieved. With this dynamic conception of embodied knowledge that is bound to the performative actions of the researcher or the collective, we are able to grasp those cultural repertoires of actions which are essential for the formation of this experimental knowledge. But usually they escape the historian's attention because these belong to different worlds of sense which are often described as non-verbal or oral knowledge traditions. So the following narrative is based now on my own experiences in performing Jules experiment and tonight I can just sketch three parts of this much more and complex story. The first one sketches the artisanal culture of one of the leading Manchester opticians, John Benjamin Dancer, as well as that of the local brewers. Both show significant importance for the development of Jules working knowledge in science that has been for a long time been unrecognized. In the second part, I will briefly sketch how Jules' gestural knowledge mattered in his laboratory work. And in the final section, I will reflect on some of his most important attempts to go public, highlighting practices of exchanging experimental knowledge between Jules and the established tradition of natural philosophers. We will see how through the process of communication, locally achieved experimental knowledge of heat was transformed into a rather different scientific knowledge claim. Uh, okay, let's begin. An early 19th century tourist guide of Manchester, James Jules' hometown, provides our first clues about this metropolis of manufactures. And I quote here out of this travel book, a custom which exists in Manchester frequently creates surprise in the minds of strangers, namely the early hour which is devoted to the dinner meal. Between one and two o'clock is the usual Manchester dinner hour. Now I'm willing to confess that I was ignorant till I beheld the scene that Manchester dines at one. Rich, poor, ignorant, learned, destructive, conservative, dissenters, churchmen, the mass, yes, the mass, all dine at one. Thus, the very heart of the day, the very best portion of mercantile operation, when the light is best, when the head is clearest, and when in almost all countries professing to be civilized, men devote their time to their most important avocations, 
is consumed at Manchester by the dinner. In this otherwise busy city, the Mancunians took their time for their lunch breaks and hence let us stay for a moment with the development of machinery and especially the self-acting tools that became prominent through the steam engine technology. Along with its invention, we see decisive changes in the organization of work, the production of goods, the standards of precision, and the hierarchy of the senses. Manchester's largest cotton mill became the model for how every operation could be ordered by rule. Contemporaries of Jewel called this automatic system or the Ministry of Civilization. Within this period, we observe the emergence of a new cultural manner based on trust in self-registering technologies and a massive stigmatization of craft knowledge and sensuous perception as being of no epistemological value anymore. In this march of the intellect, connotations of the word skill degraded in meaning from knowing to just embodying manual competencies. A circumstance nicely reflected in a commentary on the establishment of the Mechanics Institute, and I quote, machinery is su rapidly supplanting human labor and rendering mere muscular force a worthless drug. The natural machine, the human body, is depreciated in the market. But if the body has lost its value, the mind must go into business without delay. The intelligence of man must be brought to the mint and coined and set in instant circulation. Quotation end. Moreover, at this time, an important transformation of the practiced economy of the senses took place, during which the act of seeing, observation, became established as a superior scientific form of human investigation of nature. One of the masters of this optical space in the early 19th century was John Benjamin Dancer. His work represents nicely the power and the limitations that the emerging visual culture brought to light. Dancer made his first major breakthrough in the production of an achromatic microscope with unheard of possibilities of resolution. Furthermore, he magnified a flea by such a microscope and prepared on stage a photographic image of it on a silver plate. Dancer's competencies in producing precision instruments, as well as his research on making daguerreotypes and calicotypes, were extremely advanced. One of the promising test cases to achieve what he called truth to nature certainly could have been the production of a photographic image of a far distant object, like the moon, seen through a telescope. A scientific project that brought different members of the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society, like James Nathmus and Joseph side bottom in close contact with Dancer. In this project, different knowledge traditions amalgamated that finally led to the foundation of the Manchester Photographic Society and a new sensitive emulsion of glass, a type of collodion, which was highly suitable for photographic applications. This new emulsion was the missing piece for Dancer's invention of microphotography. The photographic technique allowed a miniaturization of regular photographic images of real objects. Only by putting those produced slides under a microscope, then the observer is able to see in the eyepiece, for example, the photographic portrait of Dancer himself, or familiar impressions of Windsor Castle. Natural philosophers were excited. David Brewster, for example, a contemporary of Dancer, immediately, and I said, uh, in quote, calculated that an encyclopedia of 20 volumes could, if reduced to the same dimensions, be easily carried in a purse, quotation end. So Dancer produced only miniatures of well-known images, like paper money, or later the miniature of Charles Darwin's publication, The Origins of Species. Needless to say that, that such images became a bestseller in Victorian culture. For Dancer, his technique of shifting scales was part of a broader program of producing a reliable means of orientation in the new optical space, which astronomers and microphysicists had begun to open up. Joule worked very closely together with Dancer. Geographically speaking, oh, one moment, I think. Oh, no, this is the other one. So I have just here two other pictures of the microphotographies. This one 
So Jewel worked closely together with Dancer. Geographically speaking, these two gentlemen had their premises in walking distance from each other. They spent considerable time in each other's workplaces. Jules' brewery was at Bailey Street, closely to the River Erbel, and Dancer had his shop located in the opposite direction at Cross Street. In fact, it is reasonable to say that for a certain period, Dancer's shop was part of Jules' laboratory, in which both developed their specific techniques of shifting scales. Another important site in which major changes in the economy of the census took place was the brewing culture, to which Jules also belonged. As the son of the wealthiest brewer in Manchester, this scientific brewer began to employ a steam engine as well as scientific methods of brewing at his premises. He worked every, hour, every day eight hours in this business. But in order to understand the big change from brewing as a craft to brewing on an industrial scale, we have to see the state of art before. The world of brewing was to a large extent an oral culture and their knowledge was communicated by means of performing acts. Written information hardly played a role because most of the brewers and maltsters were unable even to read and write. But the absence of literary technologies was not the only characteristic feature of this culture. The peculiar sensor, sensory order they followed gave the site of production its particular character. First of all, brewers and maltsters' judgment was very much informed through their senses' perception of touch, smell, and taste. In order to do justice to this brewing culture and their ways of acting and knowing, this peculiar knowledge, which according to a contemporary writer on brewing, results from the combined exercise of physical and mental powers, is more appropriately termed gestural knowledge. During the 1830s, the brewing industry underwent major changes, and it is for that reason that we find some important literature on brewing which allows us to study this changing world of sense in detail. George Adolphus Wigney, for example, his Encyclopedia of Brewing was published with the intention of creating a community of scientific brewers which would be able to comply with the new demands of large-scale production. But according to Wigney, in the old world, the brewer still produced relative facts and not absolute ones. And they did so because their knowledge was firstly local and, as they said, difficult to transfer to other sites. Manufacturers, as well as representatives of the British government, regarded the variety of the brewers and maltsters' experience and their locally changing standards of measurement as a stumbling block in Victorian society. Instruments of precision came to be as important for the British excise system as they were for the manufacturers. And in order to guarantee the charging, assessing and collecting of excise duties on alcohol, absolute measures had to be employed. Their want of reliable measures to levy duties created fierce conflicts between the government and the malting and brewing trade about the proper modes of working. But it was not only the excise system that practiced advanced mensuration. Slowly but surely, manufacturers were persuaded to employ quantifying technologies by scientific brewers like Wigney. From the turn of the century, hydrometers, thermometers, and slide rules became their new companions. From such thermometric data, Wigney hoped to extract a general principle that governed the brewing process and would allow the scientific brewer to predict the right mashing heat for every scale of production and time of the year. At, as a result of this new economic situation, thermometers and decimal tables became the brewer's indispensable practical and theoretical technologies. Whereas the brewing trade split into two groups over this matter of employing instruments of precision and the determination of absolute standards, the excise regarded science and their measures as the only means of successfully establishing their collecting system. No wonder that already then in 1842 the government decided to set up their own laboratory, the excise laboratory as it was called which soon became an early Victorian institution of precision measurement. Moreover, it promoted distrust in the reliability of such, for such forms of knowledge that resulted from the old brewer's sensuous order, 
The brewing premises controlled by the excise in all their operations was the place where the brewers learned to exchange accurate numerical data independently taken by the producer and the state officials. This was the training ground to learn to trust in numbers. Here, rule of thumb, proverbs, and specific sensuous experiences didn't count as reliable measures any longer. Wigney, the new scientific brewer, like Joule, was quite explicit about this change when defining science, and I quote here, by the term science, we understand it to imply that species of knowledge in the obtainment of which the mind is exclusively engaged and that the purpose of its use is to distinguish it from that peculiar knowledge which results from the combined exercise of the mental and physical powers. Experimentalists in the new system therefore regarded instruments of precision and numbers as the new representatives of accurate knowledge and with regard to the above, it does not astonish that Joule's notebook entries spill over with data as well. The increasing practices of standardization affected a transformation of the experimental culture in which precision measurement developed into an art of its own kind. Joule was a bridge figure in this process. Certainly, as a full-hearted metropolitan of manufacture, he wanted to contribute his share to the Ministry of Civilization, the automatic system, by exploring natural forces in their quantitative relations to each other. But in tune with this experience, he focused on the key experience in industrial Manchester, which was friction. Indeed, friction was regarded as the key phenomenon in Joule's time. But views of friction were quite different according to profession. Engineers, as well as users of steam engines, worked hard to study friction as a measure of work lost in mechanical processes. Armchair philosophers still treated friction in their mechanical philosophy books as a mundane side effect that should be kept at arm's length from the house of theory. Heat was the other related key issue in a natural philosophy. And with regard to its status as the prime mover of the Ministry of Civilization, it became more and more pressing to understand it in all its dimensions. Up to the 1840s, most scholars treated heat as an immaterial substance called caloric. The scientific brewer, Joule, took up this issue in beginning, beginning his series of experiments on the friction of fluids, as he called them. In order to pursue his research, he drew on two main resources. Firstly, the collaboration with Dancer, and secondly, his experiences in brewing. During Jules' collaboration with the, steam, with the scientific optician Dancer, the most sensitive and precise thermometer in the country was made. Dancer provided a calibration device, which he himself called the traveling microscope, what you see here. Um, this extreme sensitive device acted like Dancer's microscopes, which made visible the latent images of the microcosm. Joule's thermometer displayed the latent heat changes of which a standard thermometer didn't leave any visual trace. With this new mercury thermometer, he could give up the use of the then favored air thermometers, which embodied the most pressing research issue of that time, the unreliable value of the gas expansion coefficient. Joule employed the sensitive mercury thermometer firstly in his research on the changes of temperature produced by the rarefraction and condensation of air. There he states, and I quote, our knowledge of the specific heat of elastic fluids is of such an uncertain character that we should not be justified in attempting to deduce from them the absolute quantity of heat evolved or absorbed, quotation end. With this research, Joule wanted to provide a mechanical explanation of, his, of this anomalous behavior observable in the transformation of bodies by establishing a dynamical microscopic description in which the materiality of heat, i.e. caloric, had to be displayed. Therefore, concepts like specific and latent heat had to be reinterpreted, and in his series of experiments to determine the effects of the friction of fluids, he aimed at rejecting the macroscopic caloric theory of heat. His series of pedal wheel experiments was one important step to study this nature of heat. <coughs> 
Not only in his collaboration with Jewell develop they experimental techniques. The other place of learning and inspiration was the brewing premise itself. For example, the, meshing, the mechanical meshing racks used to stir the liquid in the meshing tun became a model for his pedal wheel setup. But in order to actually perform the experiment, Joule certainly needed more than excellent instruments. His experiments required experienced people. A further assistant was needed because the crucial practices involved in his experiment included not just reading temperatures, but doing the mechanical work. The experimental setup made an artistic mechanical performance necessary. Furthermore, this person has to have the physical condition of an athlete in order not to increase the room temperature enormously through the sweating body radiation. This performance of winding up 26 kilogram 20 times in 35 minutes required the physical strength of a very well-trained worker which Jewel possibly found in his brewery or amongst his house servants. The reader, meaning Jewel himself, had to take measures with a peculiar rhythm before and during and after the run. Keeping the temperature to the expected point of increase during the runs, the specific working condition due to bad light, the very fine graduation of temperature scale and the temperature fluctuation demanded the complete attention of Jewel himself. The act of reading the thermometer required a certain technique that included the right timing for taking measurements. It was a technique which he had acquired during the last 10 years as the at the brewing premise, one that became self-evident for him. He had incorporated working rhythm of a kind which now governed his experimental practice of properly immersing the thermometer into the water so that it indicated the correct temperature of the water. Indeed, Jules' whole choreography of the performance of the measuring the heat produced in the vessel was to a large degree an imprint of his brewing practice. During the course of his experimental series, he constantly improved the material culture of the experiment, but most importantly, with it, his gestural knowledge of exact temperature measurement. After several trials in his laboratory, he, has even looking, he was even looking for a more convenient space to work in. Finally, the brewer chose his own spacious brewing cellar that had a room temperature from 12 to 15 degrees Celsius, perfect for storing the beverages. Without doubt, he felt most competent performing such delicate heat measurements at this familiar site. And temperature fluctuations didn't worry him so much because he knew how to react properly. Finally, Jules had created a space of innovation, as he called it, with its own values. His sensitive measurements had made him a performer without an audience. As the reworking of the experiment has shown, nobody could have witnessed the experiment directly due to the disturbing effects of the body radiation. Neither could Jules go out and demonstrate a successful trial, but he needed to compare his measurements with the standards of other contemporary researchers. He therefore brought foreign thermometers into his laboratory, either to calibrate them against his own or to use them for air temperature readings during the trials. Finally, his studies on the friction of fluids led him to imagine a fully worked out microscopic view of heat as a complete mechanical model of the microscopic machine. The latent relation between force and heat became explicit through his technique of shifting scales that led him to regard friction as the conversion of mechanical force into heat. In his public lecture at St. Anne's Church in 1847, he spelled it out clearly, namely that motions of air and water constituting living force are not annihilated by friction. We lose sight of them indeed for a time, but we find them against, again reproduced. Quotation end. In going public, Joule experienced tremendous difficulties to gain scientific recognition for his experimental knowledge of heat. First of all, he was, only, he was the only person who could report on the actual performance in his laboratory because the sensitive thermometer measurements did not allow direct witnessing. 
his public presentations had to be done in a way that the audience would understand and believe him. Furthermore, being a brewer and collaborator to an instrument maker made him appear more a member of the Manchester community of skilled artisans rather than one of the established scientific authorities of natural philosophers. When his first attempt of communicating his experimental knowledge to the Royal Society was turned down, Joule still took it with good humor, commenting that these philosophers were evidently doubting that anything, and I quote, that anything good can come of a town where they dine at lunchtime, quotation end. At the British Association meeting in 1847 at Oxford University, he was only able to display the pedal wheel device, which led to controversial reactions. Finally, in 1850, he succeeded in publishing a long article on the determination of the mechanical equivalent of heat in the Philosophical Transactions. And this manuscript was carefully crafted. He effaced all the immense manual labor that had gone into the determination of this number. Joule described himself as the disembodied observer of nature who displayed herself. This was the closest approximation to the taste of the assumed scientific reader of whom his fellow brewer had written with admiration that they possessed knowledge in the obtainment of which the mind is exclusively engaged without the aid of bodily organs. But Joule's ma final manuscript on the nature of heat was not only written to serve a certain ideal of the scientific self, it even underwent substantial changes in content until it was finally published in the Philosophical Transaction. The original draft of Joule's paper finished with the conclusion, first, that the quantity of heat produced by the friction of bodies is always proportional and equivalent to the quantity of force expended. Second, the friction consists in the conversion of force into heat. Quotation end. But the Royal Society decided the paper could be published only on condition of taking out the latter conclusion because it implicitly made an argument for a change in the still accepted standard of knowledge about the nature of heat as caloric. In order to avoid controversy and to avoid not publishing the paper, um, he refers uh, the referees prompted Joule to extract him uh, to extract from his experiments in writing the most agreeable matter of fact i.e. a measurable equivalent between heat and mechanical work. For Joule, this was fatal. It was as if his knowledge deduced from years of experience was torn apart into an uncontroversial matter of fact and a matter of opinion. The former was established through precision measurement of the highest caliber, and the latter was probably regarded as an expression of Joule's lack of education in natural philosophy. But for Joule, Dancer and others performing experiments was a complex form of deduction. And as I have shown elsewhere, his referees never convinced Joule. The resistance to accepting his views in print indicates how fragile Joule's knowledge space still was during this period. It would deserve further detailed analysis of the stabilization of Joule's knowledge claim over time, which cannot be done here, but I will at least provide here one suggestion to rethink the status of experimentalists and experimental knowledge around the turn of that century. In Joule's time, science was about to be defined. William, Jewell, uh, William Ewell coined the word scientist in this period, and experimentation was not an activity which was easy to integrate into the established academic form of life. Members of the Republic of Letters were used to reading books, writing letters, manuscripts, and conversing with each other. However, performing experiments required a completely different sensuous and moral economy that led to the peculiar form of knowledge in the production of which head and hand were involved. Experimentalists were not mere enlightened observers of nature, but were creating effects through physical manipulation. This challenged the traditional distinction between gentlemanly and mechanical labor, and it still took further decades that the experimental sciences became fully established in the academic world. Determinations of numbers like Joule's equivalent mark another important step in the history of experimentation and laboratory science. The increase of sensitive instrument instrumentation turned the workplace into a specific site of knowledge production, 
which changed experimentation from a public spectacle to a performance demanding the extreme training of the senses and the exclusion of witnesses. Secondly, there was no common agreement about what numbers actually represented. Jules' experimental research is part and parcel of this development in which the experimentalist as a scientific persona took shape and techniques of precision measurement advanced to the 19th century gold standard of scientific knowledge. Following the various attempts of repeating Joule's experiment, which lasted until the 1920s, provides further hitherto unexpected insights about the history of this scientific fact. It even reveals completely the historical process of the establishment of experimental physics as an academic discipline. But this can be told elsewhere. Joule also did not give up when he had published it. When he received some off prints of his publication, he immediately sent it to important scholars, like, for example, George Stokes in Cambridge, with the following remarks. And I think I have it here. Yeah. This is the letter I found in Cambridge in the library. So uh, here, Jewel to Stokes. I beg your acceptance of the enclosed paper in which I have endeavored to determine the mechanical equivalent of heat with accuracy. The result at which I conceived I had arrived was that friction consists in the conversion of force into heat, but the committee of the Royal Society having disapproved of such a deduction from the experiments, I thought it best to withdraw it, although I think this view will ultimately be found to be the correct one. Let me just conclude. In 1934, the French ethnographer Marcel Mauss published an important essay called Les Techniques du Corps, in which he emphasized that the physical training of all ages, both sexes, is made up of masses of details which pass unobserved. We must undertake to observe them. Quotation end. As mentioned above, historians and social scientists have taken up this advice and studied the formation of the human body in cultural settings. The program exemplified in this essay is equally inclined to Mao's works, but wants to go a step further. We are not regarding body techniques as representing social classes or gender, as the notion of habitus implies. In our approach, we even aim at reconstructing body techniques of past individuals, but most importantly, with the aim to understand the cognitive implications of this bodily formation. The actual performance of a 19th century experiment with a replica has served as the key tool to unlock this tacit dimensions of James Joule's experimental practice. Particularly through various technical breakdowns, this trial became the site of acquiring a gestural knowledge, which provides clues to search for hitherto unrecognized historical connections. Through this kind of exploration, the conventional null image of this experiment has been challenged. The narrative has provided important insights into hitherto neglected but already existing sites of knowledge of labor to which Joule had access and which served him as informal spaces of learning. Therefore, this micro-study of Joule's experiment provides an explanation of scientific change, which acknowledges his singularity and at the same time shows that Joule's mundane self-evident gestures of work and the related embodied knowledge is connected with a much broader structural development of a web of 19th century practitioner's knowledge. From this perspective, Joule's tacit or personal knowledge is better described as historically embodied gestural knowledge, drawing on reconstructable cultural repertoires of action. And in order to gain credit for his achievement, Joule himself shaped his scientific experiment in written form in such a way that his embodied knowledge appeared as an achievement of a disembodied genius. In doing that, he himself reinforced the traditional divide between epistemology and practice and perpetuated the distinction between philosophical authorities and skilled artisans. Thank you. <laughs>